Hey, it's Craig. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Canadian History X early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Greetings and welcome to another episode of Canadian History X. If you like, you can support the podcast for as little as $3 a month. Just go to patreon.com slash Canada EHX. You can also donate to the podcast by going to CanadaEHX.com and clicking donate. On that note, thank you to Gary Hamilton and Diane McLeod, both of whom donated to the podcast this past week. If you like, you can email me at craig at CanadaEHX.com. You can find me on Twitter. My handle is Craig Baird, C-R-A-I-G-B-A-I-R-D, and I'm on Instagram at Bairdo37. If you like and you want to promote something, you can contact me about ads. I have very competitive rates and I reach thousands of people every single episode. As well, I have another podcast out there from John to Justin, and I do all of these podcasts full time. And if you give any money, well, it goes straight to me, and I truly do appreciate it. I'll make sure I thank you on the air and throughout my social media. When there is talk of the Great Depression, the United States and its Dust Bowl often take center stage. But there were many other places impacted by the Depression, and few were affected as severely as Canada. In this episode, I'm going to look at how Canada was impacted by the Great Depression. This is a large topic, so I'm only going to be taking more of a broad view of how the country was impacted as a whole, with looks at some of the provinces. As with the United States, the start of the Great Depression for Canada is generally considered to be the 1929 Wall Street stock market crash. But of course, there is much more to it including drops in commodity prices, declines in economic demand, increased debt, and consistent droughts in the West. Throughout Canada, the crash was front-page news, but most headlines gave optimism that it was only a temporary setback. The Ottawa Journal would state in its large headline, quote, Market rally follows opening decline in prices, end quote. The following day would see more optimism, with the Ottawa Journal stating, quote, Stock market prices close around high levels of day. Wealthiest financial groups supply the necessary buying support to end price decline. End quote. Little did anyone know, things would get much worse for the country. At the time when the Great Depression hit, William Lyon Mackenzie King was serving as the Prime Minister of Canada, a role he had had almost uninterrupted since 1921. In his diaries from October 29, 1929 to October 31, 1929, King makes no mention of the crash, nor does he say anything about it for some time. While most people did not expect it to be the catalyst for the Great Depression, this sort of attitude would play into King's eventual loss in the 1930 federal election. King was very slow to react to the Great Depression, and was reluctant to even acknowledge that there was any sort of crisis. The Dominion Bureau of Statistics did not even begin to register a drop in unemployment until 1930, giving a delayed response and view to the situation for King. That being said, unemployment was becoming a major news item by January of 1930. On January 31, 1930, a Western delegation went to Ottawa in order to seek an end to the unemployment difficulties in their provinces. They would call on the government to create an unemployment insurance and ask that the Dominion government bear part of the share of the cost of unemployment relief. The Western delegation would also blame the unemployment problem on the immigration policy of the government. Mayor Ralph Webb of Winnipeg would state, quote, if the government of the day would get together the Dominion and provincial and industrial leaders, the employers of labor and the labor organizations, and form a real policy to back up immigration, you would see the country go ahead so fast you would wonder what would have been the matter the last eight or ten years. End quote. The Windsor Star would echo this on August 7, 1934, when it stated, quote, We agree that there should be discrimination in the admission of would be citizens, not as to race, but as to individuals. We want healthy newcomers and people blessed with a desire to make progress, to carve out for themselves and for the families a reasonable living, even a fortune in a new land. End quote. When provinces began to ask for aid to help with their citizens, King simply stated that it was a conservative conspiracy and he would make one of the rare political blunders of his career. Called the five cent speech, he stated on April 3, 1930, that the Canadian government should not give unemployment benefits to provincial governments that had conservative leaders. He would state in the House of Commons, quote, With respect to giving money out of the federal treasury to any Tory government in this country for these unemployment purposes, with those governments situated as they are today with policies diametrically opposed to those of this government, I would not give them a five-cent piece, end quote. The next day, he would write that his speech received thunderous ovation from the Liberals, but he noted that he had made a mistake. He wrote, quote, 
It was a fighting speech, and except in two particulars was what was needed. I made a slip, I think, in saying I would not give a cent to a Tory government on earth. It was a slip in that it can be read apart from the context, and it is capable of much misrepresentation as applied to unemployment. End quote. On April 4th, the day after the speech, King saw that it was now spreading around the country, and he would write, quote, The slip I made yesterday, I am persuaded it was such, was in not seeing the single remark would be taken out of context and misrepresented and the rest of the speech would go by the boards. I am sorry for this. Also, as Prime Minister speaking in House of Commons, I perhaps went too far. End quote. For the Conservatives, this was a gift, and they would run with it through the election. They would portray King as someone who is incapable of running the Canadian government. In the July 28, 1930 election, the Liberals lost 27 seats, becoming the official opposition with 89 seats. The Conservatives, in contrast, soared ahead with a gain of 44 seats, finishing with a majority of 135. The leader of the Conservative Party, R.B. Bennett, promised sweeping changes to deal with the crisis. He would campaign heavily on his business knowledge and putting in aggressive measures to combat the Great Depression. He would state on June 9, 1930, during the campaign, quote, I propose that any government of which I am the head will at the first session of Parliament initiate whatever action is necessary to that end or perish in the attempt. End quote. Population growth in the country slowed to its lowest point since the 1880s and the 1930s, while the number of immigrants coming to Canada fell from 169,000 in 1929 to 12,000 in 1935. Deportations also increased in Canada, rising from 2,000 in 1929 to 7,600 in 1932, while 30,000 immigrants were returned to their country of origin. Many Roman Catholic women defied church teachings by using contraception to postpone births because it was too hard to feed large families. From 1929 to 1933, the gross national expenditure, which is a public and private spending, fell by an astounding 42%. Once 1933 rolled around, 30% of the labour force had no work and 20% of all Canadians needed government relief to survive. In Toronto, the unemployment rate was 17%, but in rural areas it was likely higher, but any farmer who stayed on their farm was not considered to be unemployed. That being said, 250,000 prairie homesteaders, due to drought and poor crop prices, abandoned their farms and moved to different provinces. Most fled from Saskatchewan, with the majority going to British Columbia and some to Ontario. Almost a century earlier, the Palliser expedition had come through the southern prairies and found that it was an area good for ranching, but bad for crops. I actually talked about the Palliser expedition in a past episode, so be sure to check it out. Called the Palliser's Triangle, it was identified as the northern tip of the Great American Desert. When the Canadian government wanted to get settlers to move out there with the building of the railroad, they ignored the Palliser Expedition reports and instead focused on another expedition that came through during a wet period when the ground was lush. For the farmers who settled there and their descendants, it would prove to be disastrous during the Great Depression. By the time the 1930s rolled around, the cyclical nature of the Triangle had swung from its wet period to a dry period, with the drought beginning in 1930. Due to heavy use and poor distribution of the land, along with farming practices that reduced the integrity of the land, the entire area of southern Saskatchewan and Alberta was prime for a terrible drought. By August 1930, the West was dealing with a strong drought, with corn losses being at about 300 million bushels. Potato crops and gardens were also ruined during this drought that began the decade. Only three days after the news story of the drought was printed, other news reports stated that the drought would soon be over. This, in hindsight, was not the case. By 1931, Saskatchewan's spring wheat harvest was at its lowest level since records began in 1909. The Dominion Bureau of Statistics would report, quote, The poorest prospects are in the main wheat-producing province of Saskatchewan, where the condition is even lower than the disastrous frost of May 1917. The Alberta wheat crop shows the lowest condition since the spring of 1910 when drought and frost took a severe toll. In Saskatchewan, grain crops in the driest areas are damaged beyond recovery, end quote. During the past month, all Canada has sympathized deeply with the plight of the farmers in the drought areas, both here and in the United States. We've admired them for their courage and faith. We pause in the midst of this Yuletide celebration to inquire into the welfare of a farmer somewhere in the drought area of southern Saskatchewan. We want you to hear his Christmas message in his own words and from his own lips. This is Saskatchewan. Here on the prairies, we're enjoying typical Christmas weather. 
clear and crisp and cold, with a heavy coating of hoarfrost on every wire fence and hedgerow. It's good of you, Mr. Black, to let us intrude upon you and your family on Christmas Day. You're very welcome. Why, there'll be neighbors from miles around visiting us and each other today. Is this neighborly visiting an outcome of the terrible times we've come through? Yes, I think so. You see, this community has really suffered this past seven years. We've seen our crops shrivel up in the sun. We've seen our cattle starve. We've been through plagues of grasshoppers and dust storms. We've gone short of food and clothing. These things, you know, tend to draw our families closer together. I think I know what you mean, Mr. Mac. Isn't it that same spirit of neighborliness that prompts our friends in eastern Canada to ship those carloads of food and clothing out here to us in the drought area? Yes, that's it. We have the opportunity of doing the same thing at the time of the Halifax to that. I think I remember that. But tell me, Mr. Mac, these years of hardship and growth and rust, haven't they discouraged you? Well, there have been times when things look pretty black, but we've done a little better this past season, and I think things are on the upgrade now. As a matter of fact, Mother and I were just saying that this Christmas is the happiest we've spent for a long time. Thank you. And now, Mrs. Mack, may I ask you a few questions? You know, I have an idea that without your courage, this home may not have come through the drought here the way it has. Am I right there, Mr. Mack? Absolutely. There's been many a time I would have given up without Mother's encouragement. There must have been a lot of things in years of the heart of any woman that you've had to do with her. That is true. I don't think a woman would be normal if she didn't crave nice things for her home and a few pretty things to wear. But, uh, Mrs. Mack, what have you missed the most? I think most of all, I've missed the opportunity of doing more for our children. Thank you. No, before we leave you, have you a message for others who are perhaps less fortunate than yourselves? I think my message should be one of courage. This day of all days in the year should be one to inspire every one of us to carry on the face of hardship, as our pioneer forefathers did before us. Let us all be true Canadians. In my mind, a true Canadian maintains his own independence. He needs the spirit of our forefathers, who, like the Roman soldier, found a way or made it. Our duties should come in this order. Home and family, neighborhood and school, municipality and province. With the drought came the dust storms, and while they were not as prolific as seen in the United States, they still did happen. Anne Bailey would write in her diary, quote, My son came running into the house greatly excited. Come quick, Mum, there's a big black cloud coming in the sky. He ran out ahead of me and pointed to the western sky, where sure enough there was the blackest, most terrifying cloud I had ever seen on the horizon. It was moving very quickly, and the edge of it was rolling along. Dust storms were common appearances in the Canadian prairies by 1933. On March 31, 1933, the Regina Leader reported the first dust storm of the season, stating, quote, A dust storm in March is somewhat unusual, and though it is not a record for the drought areas, farmers do not like the idea of the storm starting so early. That same year, Calgary would experience a dust storm in January. The Edmonton Journal would report, Calgary's first dust storm of the year built a thick cloud of grey whirling dust over the whole city late Monday and left its mucky mark on the city buildings, homes, and throughout the whole foothills area. Traffic was impaired, but only minor accidents occurred and pedestrians fought whirling gusts of dust." Even as far out as the Niagara Peninsula in Ontario, dust was falling. On November 13, 1933, the Windsor Star reported, A dust storm is coming from the northwest over this section of the Niagara Peninsula. Crossing Lake Erie directly to Buffalo, it has resulted in several telephone calls as a phenomena at this time of year. Cars arriving at Fort Erie from nearby rural points are covered with dust. Grasshoppers were also a problem, eating crops, gardens, even clothes that were on the line. John Gray, a reporter with the Regina Leader, would write, quote, Anybody who lived in Regina and could not get over being squeamish about walking on wall-to-wall grasshoppers stayed indoors. Clouds of the insects obscured the sun. End quote. The grasshopper menace was so bad that seagulls from the coast of British Columbia were migrating into Saskatchewan to feed on the great swarms. Uh, by about 11 o'clock in the morning, we had a choice of driving along with the windows of the car open to get some air in, and we got engulfed in dust storms by every passing car that churned up the dust. If we shut the window to keep the dust out, 
Then we, then we, uh, we have, were barbecued inside the car. It was so hot. And if we opened the window just a little bit, the grasshoppers blew in and settled on in, inside the car. Oh, that so, must have been fun. So when we, when we, <laughs> when we uh, got towards um, the, the um, oh, maybe uh, 125 miles out of Winnipeg, uh, we started to run into, into quite a heavy uh, infestation of grasshoppers blowing across the highway and hitting the windshield. And then suddenly out of nowhere, we hit a, a, a what you might call a cloudburst of grasshoppers. This was, this was one of the great swarms of grasshoppers that were blowing up from the United States. They would, they would land and eat everything within a, a radius of a, a couple of miles, take off, fly in, or, or hop or fly or, or be blown another five or six miles, land again, eat everything. And this, this cloud of grasshoppers hit our car and within a matter of seconds, the windshield was completely covered in a half inch coating of green slimy goo <laughs> that had been grasshoppers. The side of the car was the same and we had to pull over to the side of the road because we couldn't see. So here we are stuck uh, the 50 miles from nowhere in a, in a car that, uh, that was immobilized. So we had to clean the windshield. So the first thing that we did was that we, I got out um, some paper from my, my notebook. That made it worse because it just it kind of congealed the goo on the windshield. And then I had an, had an idea. I went into, into my bag and I got out a razor. It was a, 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 a patented razor that was quite common at that time called the Rolls Razor. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was a self-sharpening, it was in a, a case that had a self-sharpening hone in it. And uh, I took the little blade out, which uh, the blade was about a, uh, an inch and a half long. Uh, and was a uh, uh, one-sided so that the other the other side had a, a holder on it yeah like our safety blades that's right yeah and and so i started to clean the wind the windshield off and this thing worked pretty good except that it got clogged uh, uh, by the grasshoppers and i i got to, I got the windshield about half cleaned off on the driver's side when a farmer came along and fortunately he had a putty knife in his car he said, I always carry these in this area now since the grasshoppers got this huh. way, you see? <laughs> so we borrowed the putty knife and ultimately got that, that goo off the windshield so that, so that we, could, we could ride. Well, this, this was, I, I, I have a recollection of being violently bilious as a result of the, of the think of these things you know you ha you have no idea of what it was like to be caught out there in that burning sun with these fr grasshoppers frying on the windshield of the car and being forced to 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 clean them off not a great delicacy out there i guess not a great delicacy with the collapse of international trade canada was especially hit hard because 30 percent of canada's gross national income came from exports Canada had an extremely stable banking system which prevented any bank failures in the country during the entire Great Depression, compared to 9,000 small bank failures in the United States. Where Canada was hurt was when it came to debt. During the 1910s and 1920s, the federal government took over several bankrupt railroads. The debt was around $2 billion or $32 billion today. During better days of the economy, that debt was seen as manageable, but by the 1930s it was crushing the country. With a decrease in trade, the Canadian National Railway began to lose huge amounts of money, and that meant it had to be bailed out even further by the federal government, adding to the debt load. For the western provinces of British Columbia, Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba, whose entire crops were based on product exports, the Great Depression was even more severe than elsewhere in the country. In the prairie provinces, the low prices for their crops was one thing, but those years of droughts, storms, and grasshopper plagues they had to deal with were something else entirely. Saskatchewan will lose 90% of its income in only two years and 66% of the rural population of these provinces needed some sort of relief. In many ways, Saskatchewan would become almost a third world country. In 1928, farming brought in $363 million, but by 1933 it was bringing in only $11 million. By 1937, 66% of the population was destitute. In Winnipeg, local Girl Guide and Boy Scout organizations collected clothing to send to Saskatchewan, 
while carloads of cheese and codfish were shipped in from the East Coast by rail. Canned goods came from Ontario, and carloads of canned milk, apples, turnips, and more came from the Maritimes. It got to the point that the federal government ordered 100 rail cars to ship loaded with fruit from Nova Scotia to Saskatchewan. Halifax alone sent 35 train car loads of fish. Ontario and Quebec were not immune, though. Their economies were fueled by industry and manufacturing, and with less trade, that hurt the province's income, but not to the degree of the prairies. Both provinces had diverse industries that would help weather some of the storm. Throughout the country, regardless of where you lived, if you were working class or poor, you bore the brunt of the Great Depression. Farmers, young adults, and anyone with a small business was hurt far more than the wealthier members of society. At the time, Canada did not have a system for giving welfare to the unemployed in the country, and even though they were unemployed across the country, the federal government refused to provide work for the unemployed, stating that it was provincial or even local responsibility. Prime Minister R.B. Bennett would announce in April 1931 that there would be a move to create unemployment insurance, but only after gathering more information, stating that not getting as much information as possible would be a disaster. He would state, quote, it would bring suffering, not happiness, to those concerned. End quote. Mackenzie King would write in his diary on April 1, 1930, quote, Today was taken up in the House of Commons with discussion of unemployment. It is a desultory sort of business, academic mostly regarding whether federal government should institute an unemployment insurance scheme. End quote. It would not be until 1935 that the Unemployment and Social Insurance Act would be passed by the federal government. By the time the government did provide some sort of relief to its citizens, it was small to say the least, and it depended on where a person lived. A family of five would receive $60 per month, about $1,200 today, in Calgary, but in Halifax they would receive $19 per month, or $377 today. It should come as no surprise that cases of scurvy and dietary deficiency diseases became more common during the Great Depression. To survive, families used the cheapest cuts of meat, often horse meat, and they would recycle their Sunday roast throughout the week. Throughout the country, school budgets were also slashed, and teachers in small one-room schools were often paid far below what they were paid in the 1920s, if they were paid at all. Many were simply given notes that they would receive their pay when more money was coming in. In order to help the unemployed, the government created relief camps. They were run by the Department of Defense, and the men were paid 20 cents per day to work in the bush, amounting to a terrible $4 per day today. Women also dealt with poor working conditions and low pay. For those that worked in mills in Ontario and Quebec, they were often working 11 hours a day for $8 a week, $2 below minimum wage, with no breaks in a factory that was reaching over 30 degrees in temperature. Even companies like Eaton's profited off the work of the poor. Annie Wells would state she was paid 9.5 cents to make a dress that Eaton's would sell for $1.69. Wells would state, quote, you were told to work and work and work so hard at these cheaper rates, and you were threatened that if you didn't, you would be fired. You had to sit at your machine from quarter to eight until 20 minutes to one and go as hard as you could, end quote. Irene Duhamel would write of working in one factory, quote, It was so strict that one employee had her baby in the factory bathroom to avoid missing a day of work, end quote. And I got a job as an apprentice in a dress shop. And... They, I had to work two weeks for nothing. And then I got two and a half dollars a week for six days a week from eight to six. And they set me down on a machine which was, had no light, just a gas light. When you were working, you couldn't say a word to anybody because the foreman saw that. If you talk to somebody, it was terrible. He also, when we had to go home, they used to, we used to have to open up our purse to uh, the bus was the, sitting at the door and to see whether the girls didn't steal anything. And uh, the work was hard. The, the smallest sweatshop was terrible, filthy, dirty, everything there was, was terrible. The toilet was about maybe five, six feet from the machines. No window, no nothing, and it was filthy. When somebody left the door open, it was terrible. 
And of course, the, the, the foreman used to go around and scream and yell. And if anybody, if you, you couldn't lift your head up, you couldn't talk to your somebody who was sitting next to you. You couldn't ask anything. You couldn't talk to her. Otherwise, the foreman, when he saw it, he ran, came right over and told you, if you'll do that, you, you will fire you. I used to get sometimes headaches from just uh, working in the dark. The gas didn't give too much light. And uh, we had to work from 8 o'clock in the morning till 6. And then you, most of the time you had to work overtime. You had to work. They wouldn't let you. If, if you don't want to work, they'd fire you. Like I used to go to night school. And uh, as soon as I started to work, and I had to have work overtime, I had to quit night school. They wouldn't I, or either lose the job or, or quit night school. So I quit night school. I had to have the money, and uh, this was it. Due to the pay and the working conditions, a group of men would launch the On to Ottawa trek, which involved traveling by train from Vancouver to Ottawa to meet with the Prime Minister R.B. Bennett. The protest would only reach Regina, where it was stopped by the RCMP and Canadian government, culminating in the deadly Regina riot in 1935. I'm not going to talk much about this as I covered it in its own episode last year, and you can find it on my website, and I will include a link in the transcript of this episode. In the riot, which was the most violent confrontation of the Great Depression, one police officer was killed and dozens of men were injured and another 130 were arrested. While the Regina riot was the most famous of the riots, it was not the only one. In Estevan, Saskatchewan, local miners went on strike for better wages and working conditions. In a later commission on the riot that would occur on September 29, 1931, one woman would state that the families lived in one bedroom, two beds in there, with a dining room, kitchen, with a bed in it, and 11 people sharing their home. Rain would come into the homes, and in the morning, in the winter, snow would be on the floor. The strikers wanted the mining company to improve the homes and end the company's store monopoly as well. With the strike beginning on September 7th, Annie Buller, working with the Workers' United League, spoke in Estevan in support of the strikers. Buller was a well-known union organizer and also the co-founder of the Communist Party of Canada. On September 29th, miners began to parade through the city and were confronted by the RCMP who blocked the parade. Violence broke out and the RCMP fired at the strikers, killing three and injuring several others. The next morning, 90 RCMP officers raided the homes of the miners and arrested 13, including Annie Buller, who was sentenced to one year of hard labor. The RCMP involved in the killing of the miners were never charged. A total of 20 miners were charged with various offenses. On October 6, after a meeting with the Royal Commission Council, the strike ended with the company agreeing to pay a $4 minimum wage on an 8-hour working day with reduced rent and an end to the company's store monopoly. Today, the event is still controversial in Estevan. The three headstones for the miners still have murdered by the RCMP inscribed, which is sometimes erased and then restored by locals. In Vancouver on June 18, 1935, 1,000 protesters, mostly striking longshoremen and their supporters, marched towards Ballantine Pier, where strike breakers were unloading ships. The protesters were soon attacked with clubs by the police guarding the pier, and before long, British Columbia Provincial Police, who had been hiding in boxcars, joined the fight, as did the RCMP. The riot continued for three hours, leaving 60 injured, including 28 seriously and 24 arrested. Mayor Jerry McGear stated that the longshoremen would no longer be eligible for relief payments for themselves or their families because of the riot. Because of this, throughout Canada, political reform movements sprang up that would reshape Canadian politics, and this mostly happened at the provincial level. The Social Credit Party rose in Alberta under Premier William Aberhart. Founded in 1934, the party won a majority government in 1935 and would hold on to power until 1971 in one of the longest unbroken runs in government at the provincial level in Canadian history. The Union Nationale in Quebec was formed in 1935 and it would rule from 1936 to 1939, then from 1944 to 1960, and from 1966 to 1970. In British Columbia, Thomas Duffer and Patalo, the Premier of the province, would take the initiative from the United States and introduce a little new deal for the province. In 1937, he was re-elected with the promise of socialist capitalism, a promise he had started in 1934 with the Special Powers Act. That act allowed the government to institute health insurance, a higher minimum wage, public work projects, money for schools, the poor, and the unemployed. 
Bennett and King were not a fan of him and referred to him as a dictator, spending much of the 1930s thwarting his request for economic aid. On the federal level, the Communist Party of Canada was virtually outlawed for half the decade from 1931 to 1936, and nine of its party leaders were arrested and convicted for being part of an unlawful association. The Cooperative Commonwealth Federation was also formed as a federal party in 1932, and it would last until 1961 when it reformed itself into the current New Democratic Party of Canada. By the time 1934 came along, R. B. Bennett, facing an election in 1935 that he would surely lose if things didn't change, began to work to make some changes to the economy. The Bank of Canada Act would be passed that year, forming the Bank of Canada in 1935. The bank was in charge of regulating monetary policy in the country. In the same year that the Bank of Canada was formed, the Canadian Wheat Board was created to help market Canadian wheat and set a minimum price for it. Bennett looked to copy the growing success of the New Deal put forward by President Roosevelt, and the Bennett New Deal promised federal intervention to achieve social and economic reform, including old age pensions, unemployment insurance, and amazingly, considering his crackdowns on unions, help for labor unions. Bennett would say in a radio speech, quote, If you believe things should be left as they are, and I hold irreconcilable views, I am for reform, and in my mind, reform means government intervention. It means the end of laissez-faire. End quote. But our country faced the problem. The great dark days of depression were upon us. Our revenues had fallen and were falling. Unemployment was right. Our agrarians no longer found it possible by the development of their wheat fields to find new wealth for there were no purchasers of their commodities. The industrial fabric shivered and shook, as your president has said, because the output of the factories could no longer be purchased by those who had formerly been their customers. And so our world, our little world, in a very short few hours, a few days and months, became indeed greatly depressed. A depression that we soon learned was universal. Not confined to one community or two, but extending the most remote parts of the world, visiting alike the older civilizations and the younger, and challenging the confidence and faith and adaptability and resourcefulness of the people to the country as nothing has done before. And I quite agree with what the chairman has said when he indicated that all have suffered. The agrarian has suffered, the manufacturer has suffered, the farmer has suffered, the man who toiled by the day has suffered, the street cleaner has suffered, in every branch of human activity, in every avenue of effort, Men and women have suffered. They have suffered from this depression. They have suffered as they have never suffered before. In our own dominion in the province of Saskatchewan, where only a few short years ago we were reaping a larger harvest per acre of wheat than in the other part of the world, there was a time when after four successive years of drought, the dominion of Canada was taking care of over 300,000 men, women, and children who are without means inhabiting homes that they had builded, excellent homes, but where the land that surrounded them was as bare as the carpet here. That is a prop that made a problem for the Canadian people that we met with, that we met, that the Canadian people met by regarding it a national calamity and making contributions from every province of this dominion of clothes, of vegetables, of everything that made that would make life possible in that stricken country, at the same time the nation itself expended millions of dollars so that none in all that country were without, that no one was without, shelter, clothing, and food. Many saw Bennett, who was incredibly rich, as someone who did not care about the plight of the poor in Canada. The truth was that Bennett was rich, but he was not blind to the struggles. He would often spend his evenings in his office answering mail from Canadians who had lost everything, to which he donated $2 million of his own money to help. One such letter came from Arsene Godel in February 9, 1934, which stated, quote, The children complain of hunger and cold. It is impossible for me to adequately provide the things they ask for. It is heartbreaking. End quote. In the October 14, 1935 election, the Conservatives would have their worst performance until the total collapse of the party in 1993. They would lose an astonishing 95 seats to fall to 39, 
while the Liberals picked up 83, finishing with a majority government of 171. And at the time, it was the largest majority in Canadian history. The Social Credit Party, a new party, gained 17 seats, as did two other new parties, the CCF that earned seven seats and the Reconstruction Party that won one seat. With the decade moving into its second half, King would make promises and express sympathy for the unemployed, but he would still reintroduce the relief camps with some improvements and less isolation. This still caused problems. On May 20, 1938, protesters occupied the Vancouver Art Gallery, the Post Office, and the Hotel Georgia to protest against the issues in the work camps. The RCMP stormed the post office with tear gas and clubs, which resulted in a huge protest of 15,000 people who smashed windows throughout the city. International trade, as I mentioned, was reduced throughout the decade, which hampered the recovery of Canada. While Canada's unemployment numbers improved in the second half of the decade, productivity remained low. This is in contrast to the United States, where productivity was high, but the labor force was still depressed for the decade. Canada would see the move to becoming a welfare state during the Great Depression, but something else would happen. In a move to keep the country unified and uplifted during the harsh times, the Canadian Radio Broadcasting Commission was created. Broadcasting across the country, it played a role in helping to keep the morale of Canadians up. Many poor citizens found radio an escape, and for many, it helped to keep them optimistic about the future. The year 1937 was a very important year in the recovery of Canada. It was the year that the Bank of Canada was officially nationalized, and the CRBC became the CBC. Both of these organizations aided in the recovery of the economy. Finally, the Second World War erupted in 1939, and the increased demand for materials in Europe and increased spending by the Canadian government created a big boost to the Canadian economy. And while the Great Depression is coming up on 100 years ago, many of its effects are still felt to this very day. I hope you enjoyed that episode and my look at the Great Depression. Next week, we're looking at the Halifax Explosion. If you like, you can email me at craig at canadaehx.com. You can find me on Twitter. My handle is Craig Baird, C-R-A-I-G-B-A-I-R-D, and I'm on Instagram at Bairdo37. As well, again, if you want to support the podcast, you can for as little as $3 a month. Just go to patreon.com slash CanadaEHX. And you can donate to the podcast by going to CanadaEHX.com and clicking Donate. I'd also like to thank all of my wonderful patrons, and I apologize if I get any names incorrect. Vobs, Robert Page, Richard D., Colin Johnson, Katie Caldwell, Jeff Hershey, Kyle Murray, Steve Pakin, Matthew Gartho, Lionel Romaine, Dr. Bob Turner, an anonymous patron that I truly do appreciate, Randy Hayden, Doug Campbell, Reg W., Deborah Carlson, Francis Helbling, Nick Zinri, Shannon Marshall, Clinton Martinez, Dimitri Chauve, Aaron O'Hara Myers, Robert Dunseith, Todd Casey, Catherine Rawa, Luke S., J.P. Bear, Jason Hall, Phil Maynard, and Iris Gray. Information from Canadian Encyclopedia, Library and Archives Canada, Wikipedia, Canada's History, HistoryMuseum.ca, OpenTextBC.ca, British Columbia Legislature, CBC, Edmonton Journal, Windsor Star, and the University of Saskatchewan. Thanks. We'll see you again next time.